Hello, everyone. Welcome to Nails and Beauty Talk. I am your host, Asia the Bird. Today, I have a very special guest with us today. He is a fashion designer and fashion illustrator. Please welcome Kennedy Warren Nell. Hello, Kennedy. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Sincerely, I was so, I was just so shocked. I was like, oh my gosh, yes, I'd love to. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad to have you on the show. So in terms of with how you got started, where are you originally from and how did you get started in the world of fashion? I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri. And um, to be honest, my story is uh, kind of generic. <laughs> it's similar to a lot of other starts. Um, honestly, I come from a family of women who really love shopping and like to dress themselves and present themselves very well. So mm -hmm. I honestly started by watching my mother because my mother is one of those women that if she sees something she likes and she knows it's for her, she's got to have it. Mm -hmm. So I grew into that. And when I went off to college, I had already been drawing since I was a kid. So I went off and I started to go ahead and try to get my associate's degree in graphic design. I wanted to be a graphic novelist. Mm -hmm. Got there, started drawing. And then one day someone saw me drawing, you know, women and clothes. And I think it was just for like, you know, just a project we were doing at the time. But they were like, wow, you're really good at this. Do you make clothes? And I was like, no, and I've never thought about it. But then I started like doing research. and I was like, oh, this is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I actually want to do this. And I wasn't seeing the type of representation that I wanted to see at the time. So I definitely was like, we're going to give this a shot. So I started applying for SCAD and a lot of other schools. And when I got accepted into SCAD, I was like, all right, this is mm -hmm. what this is about to be. So I just pretty much started taking my illustrations and turning them into what I wanted. Being a SCAD was really fun. It was kind of a little bit of a struggle at first, but um, that was much more to the fact that I could illustrate what I wanted, but I wasn't at the skill level to produce what I wanted to do from that page to reality. So it was a really good time. I wouldn't trade the experience for anything in the world because I can do anything now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I also went to SCAD as well. So yeah, I graduated like 2019. So I majored in illustration. I minored in fibers. But my illustration focus was uh, surface design. So that's, um, that, that's, my, that's my end. So in terms of your SCAD experience, what was like that whole experience, like working with the professors, getting into uh, fashion design, things like that, just in terms of fashion? Um, honestly, it was it was really amazing when you're when you go to SCAD, I feel like you have the opportunities to actually branch out and figure out who you are as an artist, because when you come in, most of the time you're like, I want to do this. And then you actually take other classes while trying to go towards your actual, you know, goal. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, I actually like sculpture and things like that. So when I was there, I was able to actually build a lot of rapport with different professors, professors that had nothing to do with fashion on the face of it mm -hmm. but later on it began to be like every class that I'm taking has steered me closer to a stronger aesthetic knowing myself as an artist mm -hmm. so it was just pretty awesome I had a handful of professors that I really looked up to and it wasn't because they praised my work it was much more because of they saw the things that I was missing and so they tried to push me more towards that Mm -hmm. And I was blessed to honestly have the experience that I had because I have and do have um, associates who not, have not had the best experiences, even with some of the same professors that I, you know, myself either idolize or mm -hmm. um, just get along very well with. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say that one of the professors most definitely that pushed me a lot in the way that I needed was Professor Pappas. I don't know if you're familiar with who she was, Evelyn mm -hmm. Pappas specific to fashion she was absolutely amazing there wasn't one thing she felt that I couldn't do and she mm -hmm. just continuously drove that repetition into me do it again you, if you're upset with it do it again and as long as you're practicing every single day and putting your heart into the craft you want to do you can do it so she mm -hmm. really like drove that into me mm -hmm. yeah and I also seen like some of your fashion illustrations because I know there's like a, a fashion illustration club when we went to SCAD and Laura yeah. Wolf was um, the head of the club and she did a lot of fashion illustrations. So what got you into fashion illustration? Uh, it was definitely Laura Wolf. <laughs> she was the fashion illustration um, professor. And I, I really love drawing, period, but specifically drawing something that's going to capture an emotion and attention. And that was perfect for fashion illustration. Because there's a difference between a fashion sketch and an illustration. The illustration right. will 
most likely evoke an emotion or it's going to definitely show you the movement of the garment and how we aesthetically see it versus a sketch which is just for your technical design so when i went into illustration i kind of was on the border of oh this is really stiff and it's right. not too fashion and so she was able to draw more out of me because just mm -hmm. the length of the garment that you have to draw and the actual models that you're going to use being able to visualize all that and put it down you, it's it's a tough skill and I actually just really love it because it's so freeing mm -hmm. like I feel like when I see the image in my head now I'm able to put that down on paper my favorite things to draw with are definitely going to be um charcoal or pastel but I really love watercolor mm -hmm. and Laura helped me to figure out a style of watercolor that suited me so it was just it was awesome mm -hmm. Yeah, your fashion illustrations are really, really amazing. And the thing is, like, for me, I like shoes. So I like draw with, like, shoe designs and things like that. And I love using marker. Um, I'm a marker type of person. Um, so, yeah. So a fashion illustration, like, when I was in that club, it teaches you the figure of the woman and the poses, you know, the fashionable poses. And also how the, like how you said, the garment, how the garment moves and how they would wear it. Yeah, definitely. I That was actually... I love taking those classes, but also being able to take the life drawing classes, because I think that you have to take life drawing in order to get into fashion illustration. I might have the curricular a little muddy, but I think it went along those lines because you needed to know exactly how the hip was going to lay this way. So that way you're not drawing a girl who's literally just unangular. Mm -hmm. And but even then knowing how the body can position itself, it allows a little play with it. So that way you can draw these lavish figures and these extravagant looking silhouettes and still know that, okay, even though the sleeve is this big, you know, the arm goes over here. It's just right. those little types of techniques to bring it actually all together. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, how would you describe like your fashion design style? Like, how do you like to design clothing? My aesthetic, um, if I'm being honestly described, I love anything that is bougie, glamorous, and glittery. Um, I can be a little bit subdued because I do still love to have those classy elements, but my aesthetic is basically for women who want to make a statement without having to say anything. I want you to just walk in there and I want you to feel like you're the baddest in the room mm -hmm. and you know you're the baddest in the room. And when you pull this coat off, now everybody else knows you're the baddest in the room. I, I, I literally just want everyone to know that my aesthetic it's almost, some want to say old Hollywood centered, but I like to think of it as much more of a modern take on women reclaiming what it is to be sexy. And mm -hmm. we're not selling sex, we're selling sex appeal because there is a difference. So that's mainly like what my aesthetic is completely about. It's inclusive. I just, we're working, I'm actually working on a project right now that I'm trying to keep like under wraps, but I'm really excited about it because it's my, my venture into accessories. So. I'm really mm -hmm. excited about that. But the brand is most definitely about capturing the essence of a woman in any category and letting her know that we're going to enhance what you've got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I know that your focus is gowns and corsets. So what attracted you specifically like to a corset? Because I know you make corset designs for women. And so like, what attracted you to making like corset tops? <sighs> Well, I mean, I've always been inspired by Dior and that, like I told you, like that old Hollywood type of thing, but it's much mm -hmm. more along the lines of the silhouette. Capturing the way that the body can be contoured mm -hmm. is absolutely amazing. Like if you've ever watched RuPaul's Drag Race, there's a queen that I love named Violet Chachki. Violet mm -hmm. is very much fashion. She has the smallest waist. There's so many different things that you can do with the female form that I'm just like, oh my gosh, like we can be narrow. We can be 1920s. We can be full figured and stitched. We can be 1950s. We can be nothing at all and be modern. So when I started doing corsetry, it just gave me a way to combine the things that I love, which would be sometimes that retro fashion with what women want today. Because either way, times cross each other. We all want the same thing. The mm -hmm. 50s was an era of beauty. Today, the beauty standard is different, but the silhouettes are almost interchangeable depending on what the fabric is. So when it comes down to corsetry, I was like, okay, 
how do I take these older silhouettes and make them modern? Mm -hmm. I switch up my fabrics. I change how we're going to arrange them. I even sometimes like to add in little elements that you're not going to even want to pay attention to. You have to get really close onto them. And that's what makes each of my individual garments so special is that you have to want to see them get close enough and then go, oh, okay. So there's more, there's levels and layers to everything that I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I can tell what the, what the course is that like, they're so unique. The course tops are so unique. And I like how you mentioned Violet Chachi, but also too, if you look at Dita Von Tees, you know, she's a burlesque dancer and she wears like courses in like 1940s, 1950s style, um, vintage fashion. And you also look at, you know, in terms of sex, you look at Versace, you look at Dolce & Gabbana, you look at Valentino. Um, these are the brands that really exuded sophistication and class, but also to that sex appeal. Yes. And that's exactly what my goal is because there is a fine line to everything. And I mm -hmm. think that big brands, like you've mentioned, Valentino, Versace, they walk those fine lines of, and we're just talking candy. They walk those very fine lines of mm -hmm. sexy, trashy, you know, trendy. It, they walk all of those fine lines. And that's where I want my brand to be. I want to be able to walk those lines so finely that you're like, this is art. This is a moment. It's not just a trend. So mm -hmm. that's mainly where I'm trying to be is that you know that this is a brand and not just something for the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now you consider yourself an haute couture designer. Like what do you find like very interesting about haute couture? My yeah. favorite thing about it is that it's original and it's one of a kind. You mm -hmm. can definitely walk into any store and find an off the rag dress. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong because someone did design that. But when you're specially seeking something for a special moment or a special occasion, or even just to make yourself feel as though you are the significant one, that is where haute couture comes in. Because it is not just fashion. When it comes down to it, haute couture is capturing the skill level of the artist. Mm -hmm. It is literally being able to come up with this outlandish design ranging from, you know, haute couture, which is just high sewing and creativity to avant-garde, which is the strange and the wild. But those are right. two huge, huge segments in fashion that you can do both or you can do one or the other, but you have to do them well. And so at first I did want to do um, avant-garde, but I, doing this for the little time that I have done it, as you know, it really opens your eyes as to what you actually want to do. So mm -hmm. you do want to lean more towards that avant-garde and just be, you know, catchy and flashy. But I realize I'm much more of the couture side where it's like, I value the elements of beauty more than I value the elements of the outlandish. And while I can take outlandish things and combine them with the couture elements, that's where I meet and that's where I come into play because it begins to become a question of, is this camp or is this fashion? And I, that's the fine line that my brand, I feel like, personally walks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You look at like Scaparelli and, you know, you look at like an Alexander McQueen, like those like haute couture elements that they put in their garments, especially Mugler and, and God rest his soul, you know, yes. he made amazing garments, especially in the 90s. Whew. Oh, I mean, Mugler, it's just... It's astounding, to be honest with you, because he, him, Jean-Paul Gaultier, like, mm -hmm. that is where you meet the wild and the outlandish. I mean, Jean-Paul Gaultier's work, I just, mm -hmm. I, that is such a marvel. It's literally such a marvel, because you sit back and you think about all the silhouettes and the different shapes that he's created, mm -hmm. and it's inspiring, because he's not just taking, you know, average everyday shapes, and he's also still pulling those elements from classic Hollywood beauty or classic elements from that time period, but he's still modernizing them. And it's creating things that can still create that type of customer that want those things. Right. I, I, that is the level. That's the level to achieve right there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, what would you consider to be like your favorite sewing machines when creating like a corset or a gown? Hands down, um, and I don't want to be like this, but uh, Juki, I, mm. my baby, um, she really can like just handle anything that I can throw at her. I love Juki's because when I 
when I did start out sewing younger, I used, um, I believe it was Kenmore's and things like that. And unless it's literally an older, older machine, I'm talking maybe 90s to 80s type of machine, it's not necessarily going to hold up the way that you want it to because mm-hmm. they are older machines. They are just made different and just saying they're made better. The newer machines just don't hold up unless it's like an industrial style machine. So when it comes down to it, Juki for anything that I need as of right now. Um, and then if I have to, I'll fall back. So that, that's no shade. That's just, you know, realness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of fabric, what would, you, what would you consider to be like your favorite fabrics to use when creating garments? My favorite fabrics, uh, everyone probably knows that I love taffeta if it comes to a gown. And I like taffeta not only because of the colors that just can be done to it, but also the sound that it makes. When mm-hmm. taffeta moves across a room, it's typically used in gowns. So you can tell where the woman is no matter what, because you're going to hear this shh. Mm-hmm. and you know it's got all that volume all that tool it has body of its own to where you don't even have to do specific things to it mm-hmm. I just it's absolutely one of my favorites if it's not taffeta then it's probably definitely going to be satin and I should be weary of satin because it can be warm like sometimes too hot to wear in the summer but mm-hmm. it is one of my favorite fabrics just because of the sheen I told you I like like sparkly things and it it supplies the amount of sheen that I love because it keeps the clothes from looking um cheap it makes them feel more luxurious and then you don't have to have all of that extravagant beating much more it's just a beautiful silhouette Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely have you ever thought about collaborating with different artists such as like illustrators or like male artists and things like that with your collections and stuff oh most definitely I'm always open for collaborations it's just making sure that I have time to manage those commitments I've always wanted to collaborate with many different artists because there's so many different avenues that we can go down If you take what I do, and let's say that you're not a seamstress, but let's say that you are a painter. I've had a painter actually approach me like, hey, I'd like to paint your work. You look back and you look at like 17th century art is one of my favorite things. And if you look at those gowns and the way that they're literally painted, it's almost like they're real, all the detail, that'd be an honor for me. So taking that and translating into something else, someone else will see that. A sculptor might see it and be like, oh, I'm going to sculpt this gown. You never know what's going to happen with any type of collaboration you do. So I'm always open to a collaboration. And when it comes down to nail art, my mother wore nails from the time I was born until today. So she still (laughs) has her claws and I love it. My mother does her nails out like wild. So I'd definitely be down for anything like that. Oh, that's really, really cool. Yeah. And I'm I'm a painter and a nail artist as well. So if you want to collab, you can, you know, holler at me. (laughs) I got you. I got you. Yes. All right. So I want to get into the progression of fashion. So what has been your perspective on the progression of fashion and as well as where it's going? For me, one of my biggest things within the past few years was just trying to make sure that I was seeing enough representation. That's the main thing that I had wanted. Um, And I am seeing it more. I'm seeing it slowly, which is fine with me because progression is progression. I don't want anything rushed because then it doesn't feel genuine. So it was much more seeing many more POC models in the front ads of campaigns, not just in the back or used as props. It was much right. more of seeing a lot of Black artists highlighted and noticed, and not for the sake of a trend of spotlighting a Black artist, but actually taking in their work and right. what they have to offer. So I'm seeing a lot more of that. One of my, one of my close friends and favorite designers, because she does crochet, is uh, Chelsea Billingsley. Mm. and Chelsea that is one woman that is a legitimate powerhouse like she she's absolutely amazing there's nothing that Chelsea can't make and there's nothing that she can't do and I believe that her work deserves to be highlighted and because of her hard work continuously day in and day out she is building and she is going a lot of designers that I went to school with are actually out here and they are creating and they're striving and they're making waves one of my favorite people Christopher John Rogers, he went to SCAD and I knew him for a few moments. And I say a few moments because it was just more in passing and me like watching his work and seeing his transformation. He owns his own fashion house now and he dressed um, the vice president. Like Mm -hmm. he has dressed her. That was his clothing. That is the height that he has set for a lot of us to reach. And it's been amazing 
to watch these things happen. I was, I think I was more excited for when he did it than he was. So (laughs) it's seeing those types of feats and realizing that this is exciting, but we still have so much further to go. It's just amazing. Like, because if, if he puts it out there that if he can do this, you can do this. And so that's always been like one of the people that I idolize, especially not since we're like looking at celebrities or anything like that. We're looking at real people to follow and to look up to. He's definitely one of them because the man is intelligent and he knows what he wants and he knows how to run his brand. So mm. I'm seeing I'm seeing fashion head in the way that I wanted to. I'm hoping that it continues to do so. I haven't been too recently disappointed with anything that I've seen because other than that, I probably would say something. But um, it's all been, um, it's been pretty on the up and up. I just, I do want to see more recognition, just just a little bit more. That would make me more satisfied with the state of fashion right now. I will say that I am seeing some, um, I'm seeing some questionable things done by some of the higher end brands. Whereas I don't think that the runways that they're producing is anything uh, innovative. I don't think it's anything right. necessarily creative. I think that mm-hmm. some of the brands are, in a little bit of turmoil, just because when it comes down to it, you do have to figure out how to connect with the audience of today. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that they really know where everyone's head is right now in terms of clothing, especially trying to take in the economy and, you know, everything else that's going on. I think that they're kind of just floundering a little bit. So especially in some of the brands that I I really like, I'm just like, "Ah, okay, this is where we are and this is what we're doing, but we could do better. Mm -hmm. Right. I could definitely agree with that. Like how you said, Christopher John Rogers, Chelsea, who I follow, like her work is uh, absolutely amazing. Another designer that I interviewed, um, I think last year, the year before, Nelly, the designer, you know, she's doing big things. Like she had um, one of her designs worn by Lil Lil Durk, you know, her stuff got worn by uh, Young Baby Tate and Lucky Day. So you know, these are our colleagues that are getting themselves out there. And I actually did nails for Nelly the Designer's uh, most recent uh, collection. So I'm just really proud of where fashion is going, especially with us being Black and we're having that representation, not only from a model standpoint, but also a designer standpoint, and especially Black nail arts are getting out there and more nail arts are getting recognition, just collaborating with fashion designers. So that's really, really amazing to see. Yes, I mean, absolutely. And Nelly, Nelly is again another one of those black women that is absolutely unstoppable. Like mm-hmm. I, every time I get on my Instagram, sometimes I run to her page and I'm just like, oh my gosh, yes, like she's at it again. Like <laughs> she's mm-hmm. doing it again. I just love to see how creative they can be because you don't get to see every side of a woman at any point. Sometimes you just get on, you know, and you post these pictures and people create this idea of you. And then when you actually start to expose yourself for what you really do, whether you run your business, whether you're a model, you can get a lot of backlash, you know, and things like that, because there are people out here that are unhappy with themselves. And so they don't necessarily want to support you, whether you're actually a good person or a good artist, doesn't matter to them. If you're doing something that is slightly better than what they have going for themselves, it's kind of like, you don't have that support that you need. But what I love about the community and network that I have, being surrounded by these powerful women, I feel like there's so much just uplift, at least amongst us, because it's not a time where um, I'm not sharing what they have going on. So that way everybody can get a chance to see it. Because I think that their work is absolutely amazing. Like Nelly's just, she's tops. She Mm -hmm. just literally tops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's really, really cool. And the thing also within the fashion industry or within the beauty industry, which is um, I'm in the fashion, but also I'm in the beauty industry. I'm a licensed cosmetologist and my focus is nails. So the thing is with any industry in this world, we have to work five times harder than anyone else as black people of what we do. And we have to be much better at it. And the thing is like with Angela and Tally from the, uh, he made his book called The Chiffon Trenches. He talked about you know, you have to work a lot harder. You're still recognized as Black first, you know, here in in America or in any industry that you're in, you're Black first. Yes. I mean, in that, I have this conversation often with some of my non-POC friends, and it's never a bad conversation. It's just, you know, us discussing, like, you know, what actually happens during a Black person's transition into their field or into trying to achieve what they Mm -hmm. want to do. You are identified by your skin first and your resume second. 
Mm. Because there's always going to be that dynamic of questioning whether you're actually capable and comparable or not. And I don't think that that's fair at all to say, because you should never expect greater things or lesser things from someone based on their race or their ethnicity or however you want to put it. Mm-hmm. It's it's all it's a constant, constant struggle, especially I remember when I was working in New York for a while and mm-hmm. I was an intern and it was it was a great I personally would say that it was a great experience. Mm-hmm. However, I, you know, was met with a few questions from myself. I was just like, okay, well, I'm the only black male here. Right. Then I look around and I see that there is only one black supervisor, or I guess you could say head designer, and she's female. And yet she is still the only black woman in the office. And I never want to equate things to race because it's not always that issue. But I do find it strange how, you know, there's sometimes only room for one and there, but there's so much potential, so much artistry, so, so many ideas that right. can be provided and brought to the table just by including everyone. Right. So I, I was just really confused by that. And I knew she herself was confused by the presence or lack thereof when she came up to me and said, you know, it's really nice to see, um, it's really nice to see a brother in here now. And I, I'm excited to see what, what you can do. And mm-hmm. I, I let it wash over me because I knew exactly what she meant when she said it. And I just wanted to show her, you know, that, hey, like I'm here for the game as well. Like we're going to open up some doors. We're going to do this. Mm-hmm. I've had many instances like that throughout my career where it's like being, you know, approached by fellow POC and them going, hey, you, you see how this is going? And I'm like, yeah. I didn't see how this is going. You you here to show out? I'm like, yeah, you're all right. Like, you know, we gotta rock this out. You gotta represent. You have to, you have to be a cut above. And that's it's it's a point of pressure where you're always on. Always on. There is no slippage for you. That's all right. that there is to it. You you have to be on because you get literally one chance or else you're gonna be dragged through the mud and thought of as dead. So you have to be on constantly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, how would you define success? To me, success, success is happiness. Success is literally me being, to me, success is me being able to wake up every day, get into a three-piece suit and walk into an atelier where I am designing and constantly creating and making a difference with my brand. To me, that is success. I don't know how anyone else can measure success because I think that it is measured off the goal that you personally have. If your goal is, who own your own business, that is success to you. If your goal is to one day just continuously work from home and never have to leave the comfort of your own personally created environment, that is success to you. Me, success is having a strong brand and then having an even stronger and lasting presence. That's Mm -hmm. what I'm measuring my success against. So I'm nowhere near as successful as I want to be, but I'm still working towards that end end of success so success for me is literally being able to get up and say I am a designer I design I do this daily and I don't take a break from it and I just keep growing that's success for me Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and you know I'm the same way it's like you know I haven't felt that top of the mountain like I'm at the top of the mountain like because I know I can achieve a lot more so I can definitely, I'm definitely with you on that, but also too, in terms of with, with success as well is mental health. Cause I think, you know, I'm glad that, you know, us in the black community are getting into talking about mental health and saying, it's okay to see therapy. It's okay to talk about what you're going through. And the thing is the biggest thing, I think while we're maintaining success or achieving success or maintaining a work ethic is to have that emotional support system for us as a community. We have to have a support system. That's why a lot of people will meet me and they'll say, oh, you're so nice. You're so friendly. And it's not that I'm nice. and It's not that I'm friendly. It's that I know that everyone in the world is going through something different at any point in time than I am. So there is no reason for me to bring my personal negativity into anyone else's life or any problems that I have. When I meet someone or when I'm interacting with someone, my main focus is that we're equally enjoying each other. And so you have to be able to step outside of your mentality into someone else's or at least meet them halfway. It's not a game of just running out here and thinking that you're the only person who matters. You have to be able to talk about how you're feeling and be able to express yourself. And I I don't think that a lot of 
POCs are allowed to express themselves fully because sometimes it does turn into an attack on your mental health. If you're, you know, just having a bad moment, you're not necessarily allowed to have a bad moment because your anger is going to be measured by other people differently. So if you're very upset and you already have that, you know, angry Black woman mentality out there for someone else, it's very hard for you to feel comfortable to even say, hey, I'm having a bad day or, you know, um, this and this is going on without someone feeling like, oh, okay, well, let me walk on eggshells because I don't want you to lash out. If you're not checking up on the mental health of everyone else, then you're not providing a positive outlet for yourself because you mm. are blocking all types of energy, mm. if that makes sense. Like it just, it's, it's all about checking up on other people and being yeah. able to let people check up on you. It's hard to not be guarded these days, but with the way that everything is going, if you're not able to express yourself, it's just not a good look. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's the thing we have to, you know, share with each other what we go through and be able to listen. And I think that's the biggest thing, you know, no matter what generation we're, we're from, I think the biggest thing is to listen to each other and to support each other as a people and not be afraid to be vulnerable, um, you know, every, every now and again. So I think that's, that's healthy. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to cry. It's okay to not be okay at certain points in time. Definitely. But that's, that is a huge thing, though, is that, you know, you don't cry, you don't show any type of emotion, because then you're showing weakness. And that in itself takes a shot at the mental, because if I cannot, if I can't cry, and I can't express myself, how am I supposed to be able to heal, move on and grow? It's, it's a terrible cycle. But I do think that therapy, being able to talk about it, that's, if you even if you don't want to talk about it, having some type of outlet, to relieve that stress on your mentality mm -hmm. is helpful. I mean, I create art when I'm upset. I sew when I'm not having the best day. I channel that energy into my art because sometimes that's the only way that you can let it out and it be out in the open and you feel good about it because either people will pick up on the emotion that have, has gone into this creation or it just exists. But either way, you are mentally decompressed and stress-free because you channeled all of that negativity into your art. There's a lot mm -hmm. of artwork out there in these museums that did not come from happy places, but yet paint a beautiful picture. Mm -hmm. So just being able to have those creative outlets can also help with that mentality. So mm -hmm. you do have options, therapy, or you can be therapeutic to yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also sometimes to give yourself grace too you know, even at the times of when you fail and, it, and it's okay to fail. That's just part of the process of being um, successful. You know, you're going to fail, you know, until you succeed. And like how you said, success looks different for everybody. It does. It does. But failing, like you said, is not, don't let that be necessarily an option for you. You don't have to you right. know, stop doing what you're doing just because you fail. I failed. Every time I try to sell something legitimately right off the bat when I began, but right. now because of that repetition, I can do whatever I want, but you, you have to be able to take that failure in stride and it's okay. It's, it's some of the best of us have failed because that's the only way that you're going to learn. Right. If you don't do it wrong, you're not going to get it right. And mm. don't let the things that you are super, super great at doing cloud the way that you can fix or work better towards the things that you aren't because just because you can't do it now doesn't mean that you can't do it later mm -hmm. yeah yeah keep trying is is the, the best and that's the same thing with me when I was doing nail art you know it was repetition you know and I, and I got better in time that's the same thing with anything so you know you have to apply yourself in the skill set that, that you want to have absolutely yeah. most definitely it's it's actually just being able to say, okay, I messed up. Some people are probably going to see that I messed up, mm -hmm. but hey, they mess up too. So we're just going to keep going. Yeah. And it's, it's a hard mentality to have, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Um, now, what's next for you? What are like your future plans or, you know, anything? Like, what's next for you? So without like trying to give too much away or anything like that, um, what's next for me is I'm going to try to do an actual in-person show at some point. And I want to say within at least the next year or so. 
I want to be able to actually solidify my brand by showing, you know, everyone what I can do and what I have to offer. So we, I do have some like big, big steps like going on, but main focus right now for what's next is, as I mentioned earlier, my accessories endeavor. So I'm like really, really excited about that because I get to, again, <laughs> walk that fine line of this is a couture piece, but it has an extravagant being about it. So I'm, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I'm hoping to draw in um, new clientele, fresh clientele, new collaborations. So just just a whole bunch of great stuff in the works. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of like your garments, real quick, I could see you like designing something for uh, Tiana Taylor. That'd be really, really cool. Either Tiana Taylor or like Naomi Campbell. I like two of my top, top, top people because I know about Tiana, I'm dating myself at this point, but I know about Tiana Taylor like back when I was in like, um, I think it was like middle school going to high school. And like, I just, I, I was so obsessed because there's something special about the authenticity that she just has about her. She is who she is, and especially Naomi Campbell. I mean, Christopher actually dressed Naomi Campbell in something, and that was a goal for me, was trying to dress her. So I would love any shot that I had at that, because to me, that's fashion royalty right there. You get no better than that. Like, mm -hmm. it's, <laughs> it gets no better than that. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm open to all possibilities. Got some, like, you know, plans in the works that I can't necessarily talk about right now, but Mm. Um, I'm excited and I'm just really thankful that you, you know, invited me on for an interview. And I hope that you also keep watching my journey because I'm excited to say, hey, you should interview me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that's the thing. I wanted to highlight you and your work and, you know, highlight different designers and especially, you know, to understand their story. And I want you to share your style of work because I think it's very, very different from a lot of other people. So I'm very, very proud of you. And you know, keep going. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm representing for all of the weird kids who do something different, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but have a lot to show. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, last but not least, where can people find you on social media and how can people support your work? So you can find me on my Instagram. That's going to be um, Kennedy underscore Warren L. And when you scroll through, if you do want to purchase anything, just go ahead and shoot me an email. My work is custom made and tailored. So anything that they got going on, I'm pretty sure that I can handle. All right. Well, thank you so much. Your work is absolutely phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. All right. Well, take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> well, thank you. Bye-bye. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. Be sure to click the bell for notifications. Also, follow me on my social media platforms and visit my website, asiaticbird.com, and be on the lookout for more interviews to come very soon. Take care and stay beautiful.